salary. I think he's worth one of the top yeah. five big. Him, yeah, the yeah, part, him and his father the Park and how many people are just yeah. Cool. Oh. Yeah, they'll come out later. Yeah. yeah. Well, he's like he was a part time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we'll call the meeting to order for February 20th, the commissioner's public commissioner's meeting. So, um, Karen, would you take roll call? Connie Coleman Lackady. Present. Don Daniels is excused. James Guerrero. Here. Nancy Hudson Eccles. Present. Ryan Pearson. Here. Paul Wegman. Christopher Weber. Here. You have quorum. Thank you. So we first have the approval of minutes for February 6, 2019. Everybody looked at the minutes. Make a motion to accept the recommendation of the recommendation. Second. And thank you, um, Commissioner Wagaman, and seconded by Commissioner Guerrera. Any comments or discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Any agenda updates? No, ma'am. Okay. Uh, any public comments? Anybody want to come to the podium, recognize yourself and the city you live in? My name is Al Schmouter. Um, I live outside the watershed. I'm the stewardship, stewardship uh, chairman for the Chambers Clover Watershed Council. And uh, I tell myself, it's always a pleasure to come meet with you folks that are public servants doing the deeds you do. Thank you very much. Tonight, you're going to hear about the Shoreline Master Program. Uh, and uh, I want to applaud the staff for including an update of the restoration component to that plan. The SMP has policies and goals, and the restoration plan is, is the guts of the program. It's the engine that makes changes and improves things. And that's very, very important to stewardship and to our Watershed Council. Uh, there are two issues I'd like to put before you to watch this, as this process uh, goes through on the approval of the Shoreline Master Program. Number one is the effectiveness of the SMP. The city is required, I'll read what it says, to periodically evaluate the effectiveness of the SMP in achieving no net loss of shoreline ecological functions with respect to both permitting and exemptions. It's in your SMP, and I think it's got a whack uh, backup for that too. Unfortunately, uh, this is not going to happen. Uh, there's going to be, there's, there's no analysis of the effectiveness of this SMP, which is kind of too bad. Normally, if you put policies in effect, after a certain amount of years, it's been seven years now, somebody should look at that and say, have we really got the right wrench on this nut? You know, is it working? Now, I, I, we, uh, Tiffany asked, I asked her to find out if, uh, has there ever been a, uh, an analysis of the effectiveness of the SMP? Of course, the answer was no. And their boss says, and uh, this is an un, unfunded mandate by the by Department of Ecology. And unless we get money uh, or something happens, we're, it's never going to happen. We're not going to be able to determine if the SMP is effective. All right. That's a problem. Now, I used to work with General Harrison, and he said, you know, don't bring me problems, kid. Bring me solutions. 
Hey, here's a possible recommendation. You could use the services of a retired certified internal auditor with 30 years of government auditing experience to perform an analysis of the shoreline management plan. An estimated fee is about $500. He'd almost do it pro bono. So I'm gonna put that in the, in the kitty. We could offer that as a, you know, a contribution to, to help see if this program is really working. I think it might be an interesting proposal. The next problem or issue is achieving restoration goals. Now the city's restoration plan is a ma major part of your SMP. Uh, it lists the goals, uh, the problems we have in the in watershed, uh, what projects we're gonna be trying to, to implement, and our accomplishments. And this is an excellent place to give the city credit for the $10,000 a year that this city puts into the small grants program for the Chambers Clover Watershed Council. We get really bang for our buck. 20, you, every year, Lakewood supports at least four projects in school kids and uh, conservation district or other places, and they do things with that $2,500 and it's tremendous the value you get out of it. So you should get credit for that. That should go in the shoreline management plan, and I think uh, Tiffany has got some of that data, but we want you to get credit. But uh, the shoreline management, or the restoration plan uh, is, pr is pretty much not working. In fact, when we started this program, due to staff changes, staff was not even aware that there was a restoration plan component to this thing. So one of our members showed it to him and said, oh, yeah, that's a good thing to have. So thank God and goodness that Tiffany and that folks that put this thing in to have it looked at. Um, now, how can you keep this thing updated? You know, they think it's a big drill. Well, here's a suggestion put out by this gentleman over here, Kurt. He says, why doesn't the city host a restoration conference annually inviting landowners, watershed council members, Conservation District, Audubon, fly fishers, beekeepers, fish, fish and wildlife, the Puyallup tribe, and others in the public, and use this conference to gather ideas. Let them synergize together and, and find out what's going on. Then you capture that data, you take the best of it, and you use it to update your restoration plan and say, look, Audubon says they want to do an education program, and that's right out of the SMP. They want to go out and, and help people learn how to keep their backyards and repairing areas good. At low cost, they're doing the work. Let's put that in our restoration plan and let's make it happen. Um, I just saw yesterday, today that the, in King County, the Conservation District holds workshops on repair and restoration for landowners. Come in free. You've got the Conservation District at your will and call. There, you pay the fees for them. Somebody says, hey, would you do a conference or a little uh, up, a workshop for us? It's going to cost you very little money, and you're going to get a lot of bang out of it. So thank you for helping make Lakewood a robust, thriving, and caring city. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, Kirk? Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Kirk Kirkland. I'm with the Audubon Society in Pierce County. I'm here today to talk about the shoreline plan, some of the um, suggestions and improvements um, we think will make it a better plan. Audubon Society has been working with Clover Creek Council and Chambers um, Watershed Council to do their education outreach program. This is a similar idea that is in your shoreline master plan. Um, we produce a, a pamphlet um, like this, and I'll, I'll send this around as a sample. It um, tells people what they can do in their backyard to um, help the groundwater problem by changing fertilizers, looking at plants and animals that could um, uh, make the bring more bird song and liveliness to their backyard. But ultimately, um, by changing planting and, and such in your backyard, you can also help the groundwater, which um, is what the fish need to be able to come up out of Chambers Creek and make it into Lake Stillicum and go on further up Clover Creek and get through Lakewood. Um, so we've been working on this plan for about a year and um, we'll be continuing. We look at 500 um, homes every, every year um, and we uh, invite them to a workshop. We, treat, we teach them about what they can do in their yard, how to uh, make improvements. 
and we we're going up the creek until or going down the creek until we get to Chambers Bay. So we'll be involved with citizens of Lakewood probably next four or five years. So to, to formalize this relationship with the nonprofits that are already working, we have made suggestions to your um, shoreline master plan. And I have a letter here for you um, with all the details. It lists the, the, the code that shoreline management um, requires and then how we're going to be implementing that. In some places I go and, th and look at some of your goals where they're setting a goal. I um, take the next step and show you where you're already implementing the goal so you recognize the groups that are working on this. So it's a it's kind of a guide for the changes we'd like to make. There's more than I want to go into in detail in three minutes, but your staff and people can look at it. One of the important parts about having setting the goals is how you're going to accomplish them and how you're going to get through this. Well, we're very fortunate that when we started the process, they, they didn't recognize they had a re, um, restoration plan, but now they do. Not only that, Tiffany and the staff have agreed to have that plan looked at by some consultants, and they're going to bring you some, change, some changes to update what was said in 2013 to bring it up to 2018. So we're going to move forward. And we have some suggestions of what, you, what the staff could think about doing as they're updating that plan. We have a lot of information because we're actually doing work in the creek and know where some of the problems are and also some of the excesses. And then the final thing we'd like to have, have the Planning Commission and the Council consider is having some kind of a, a yearly annual meeting where you get everybody together and you say, this is what we did last year, this is where we failed, this is what we need to finish, and this is how we're gonna go forward. And then we could share the information of all those working together to make this plan move forward. We just don't wanna have another great shoreline plan that has great goals, but nothing happens. And um, we can keep this from being shelf art. And this, this information I'm gonna leave with you tonight is, is one of the ways you can get there. It's a map, if you will, of um, how we can make this work for everybody. So thank you for your time and um, I look forward to working for you, working with you on this project. Okay, thank you so much. So you leave that to Kara. Okay. Anyone else for public comments? Anyone else for public comment? Seeing no one step forward. Um, unfinished business. Do we have any unfinished business? No, ma'am. Um, we don't have a public hearing tonight. Correct. The new business will be the Shoreline Master Program Periodic Review. Tiffany? Thank you, Madam Chair, and good evening, members of the Commission. Uh, so, very timely public comment because that's exactly what we're covering first tonight on our regular agenda. Um, in front of you in your packet, starting on page, excuse me, six, you'll see uh, my brief cover memo that explains where we're at in the process. And then starting on page seven of your packet <coughs> is what's called the periodic review checklist. And this highlights for you now where amendments have been made and suggested so far based on ecology's recommendations and internal staff review of the Shoreline Master Program. And then following that, starting on page 11 of your packet, is the full Shoreline Master Program. And within that, there are a number of amendments, but they are summarized again in that checklist at the start of it. What's not in your packet as of tonight is the restoration plan, which was mentioned in both of the uh, public comment folks' testimony that you heard tonight, that will be a, a third piece that you will see before the public hearing on March 6th. So if you were to step back and look at it from strictly a legal standpoint, the restoration plan is something that a city is supposed to have, but it is a voluntary process, meaning there isn't a thou shalt do X, Y, or Z. It's These are ideas and policies and opportunities to coordinate with property owners and uh, organizations to move forward with restoration activities. And there's supposed to be something there for a city. But unlike the master program, which is where you see regulation and development controls, the restoration plan is a voluntary living um, amending document all the time. So again, tonight we're gonna be talking about that checklist and the program itself. And then you will have the restoration plan in front of you prior to the public hearing, which is scheduled for your next meeting. And we basically talked about this already, but you have a periodic review going on, which is 
um, I just in shorthand used to, will say that this is a technical amendment, meaning we're not doing a comprehensive look at every single page and every single policy within your shoreline master program. The city adopted its shoreline master program or SMP in 2014. And what's happening right now is the state is asking all jurisdictions that have an SMP to do this technical update, make sure it's consistent with state statutes, make sure it's consistent with other sections of, in this case, the Lakewood Municipal Code. And then uh, once everybody has done that, going forward, there's going to be periodic reviews, kind of like you'll see with the comprehensive <coughs> plan for the city of Lakewood. And that's when you may update policies or, or a more substantive change to the program itself. So within the periodic review, that process is talking about changes in requirements of the Shoreline Management Act and guidelines, which are the Washington Administrative Code. And then, as I just mentioned, changes for consistency with the city's comprehensive plan or regulations. And then if there's other change circumstances or new information, you would be taking that into account. There is not a requirement for the periodic review to comprehensively revise your inventory and characterization reports or restoration plans. However, as you heard in public comment, what you have coming in front of you uh, this year is in fact an update to the restoration plan as well as to the program. If you were to want to take a look, you have it in your packet in front of you as a commission, but anyone in the public wants to take a look at what's being proposed, that website, lakewoodsmp.org, is live, and that is where both the draft program and the restoration plan draft are going to be housed, and people can look at that at any time they like. Um, and they, if not already, have what's on uh, or what's included in your packet. It will be there very shortly. So just what is the jurisdiction of a shoreline master program? Because this is not the only development regulation or critical area regulation in the city of Lakewood. It has its own critical area ordinance, which is separate and apart. And then there's also just standard, if you will, development regulations that also apply to these properties. Shoreline Master Program, though, specifically applies to a portion of the city. The lakes that are greater than 20 acres in size and streams that have a flow greater than 20 cubic feet per second. And then um, if there are associated wetlands with those water bodies, those wetlands are also covered. So if you were to look, and I know it's small both on your screen probably and um, out here in hard copy, that central map, that is the jurisdiction for the Shoreline Master Program in the city of Lakewood. And the reason you have different colors along the water bodies is they have been uh, classified in various categories. So um, urban, uh, park, conservancy, natural, um, some of the other ones that are in there in these different colors. And then on the right-hand side of what you see on your screen are the lakes and creeks mm. that are in, uh, covered by the plan. American Lake, Gravelly Lake, Lake Stillicum, Wahop Lake, Lake Louise, and then Chambers and Clover Creek, and there are associated wetlands with uh, Clover Creek and uh, Lake Stillicum in particular. And so it's the water bodies themselves, and then it's 200 feet beyond that uh, uh, landward of the ordinary high water mark for those water bodies. That is the area that is actually governed by the Shoreline Master Program. The way we've provided information to the public about this effort so far, Last November, there was a property owner notification sent out to over 1,200 property owners uh, adjacent to all of these regulated water bodies, the lakes and the creeks. There's been the uh, interaction with the Chambers Clover Creek Watershed Council and now the Audubon Society as well to gather information on projects that they've been doing since the last time this program was updated and the last time the restoration plan was reviewed. We've been using not only that Lakewood SMP website, but also the city's general website, and then on the Facebook page as well. And then immediately before tonight's meeting, as well as immediately before the January 16th meeting, we had open houses. There were 38 people who attended uh, the first open house, and um, I guess you can check by the population of tonight's open house. Maybe we answered the questions and satisfied their curiosity or pointed them to the right place. Uh, we did have people here tonight, but it wasn't the 38 that we had the first time. So any questions so far? Continuing, okay. So I'm just gonna walk briefly through the actual changes that are proposed within the program document itself. And again, that starts, I believe, on page 11 of your, your packet. And you would, if you were to go through this, you would see all of these in red light and strikeout. But the checklist is a more concise way to take a look at this. 
So the first thing changing, what is the threshold for substantial development in a shoreline area where you would have to uh, get a permit? The uh, number uh, or the value of that has gone up to $7,047. The definition of development was updated per uh, changes to ecology's definition of development. There was uh, bringing in a WAC reference and uh, the checklist guidance in uh, one of the sections of chapter six. We were uh, incorporating in this draft non-conforming uses and development definitions, again, from ecology default language to be consistent with state rules and state law. Chapter six sub H was amended to include and, and update the scope and process for periodic reviews. Throughout the document, there was just an outdated reference to Title 14A, which is no longer in Lakewood City Code, so that was changed to Title 14. Uh, again, there was language regarding um, wash dot projects and the fact that there's a 90-day target for local review. That was incorporated into Chapter 6 at Sub 2, or, sorry, Chapter 6C, Sub 2, Sub E. You've got another couple of threshold changes on the valuation for replacement and freshwater dock uh, thresholds. You have, um, again, amendments from 14 to 14A and talking about the approved Federal Wetland Delineation Manual. Subsection uh, Chapter 3, B, 6, C, 15, going and referring to a, a per corrected WAC section or Washington Administrative Code section. Once again, wetland mitigation banks and the re amending the site from 14A to 14. Updating the definition of floodway in chapter seven of the document, uh, including within the document now the figure one, which shows uh, the shoreline uh, master program jurisdiction, and that's been slightly updated since the last version of the document. Uh, amending the sign references within this package may have to be, just be put on hold until the city council's done with the sign code update. You'll recall last fall, the uh, Planning Commission took a look at the sign code and had to update it because of a U.S. Supreme Court decision that's now making its way through the council. And so once that's done, the Shoreline Master Program's reference to that will be updated as well. And then there's a number of technical Scrivener-type amendments that were made uh, per city staff recommendations. And so you'll see that list there. Uh, again, some of it is just changing spellings or updating a couple of things. One that's a little more substantive is in chapter two, sub F as in Frank, one D five, there was a reference to subdivisions of more than four lots. That's being updated because now under state law, a short subdivision or short plat can be up to nine lots. So this is being updated to reflect that. And then um, at the bottom, as I just mentioned to you, the restoration plan wasn't ready for tonight, but it'll be to you prior to the uh, public hearing on March 6th, and it will also be put up on the website for, the, for anyone to look at should they want to. So the next steps for you as a commission will be that public hearing in a couple of weeks, and then the following meeting you're scheduled to take action unless you wish to have more time with the document before you do so. And then the council at this point is scheduled to start considering the Shoreline Master Program update on April 8th. And with that, any questions? Um, yeah, I did have a couple. So um, on page 121, there's a reference to Lake Stuicum here, here in Dock, and I can see that it was just kind of moved from one spot to another, so you might not know the answer, but it talks about grading, but only on Lake Stuicum. I'm curious why that lake got specified when the other lakes don't have that. I will have to follow up with you. I don't know why that is specifically uh, mentioned rather than other lakes, unless Lake Stillicum is the one that's the shoreline of the state. It's the only one that's designated as such. I'm not sure if that's the reason why. But the idea here with this amendment is to bring it up into that table just so it's more visible, so people will pay more attention to it rather than being in tiny print in the footnote. Yeah. But I'll, I'll follow up with you. Yeah, and I could tell it wasn't a change. I was just, it just right. brought it to my attention. Um, so my other question is relating to um, um, shorelines that aren't covered by this. So we have several, like Fleck Creek or um, Carp Lake, they're not covered by the shoreline master plan, so they're just, but they're still shoreline, so they're just covered by the general code, is that? The general code, any um, critical area issues related to how the slopes might come into the water body, something like that, or if there's wetlands nearby, yeah. The shoreline master program, again, the cutoff is 20 acres in size for a lake, or that 20 cubic feet per second flow through a, 
a creek. So if there are smaller lakes or if there are slower flow, they're, they're there, but they're not regulated by the Shoreline Master Program. So I'll be looking at uh, critical areas for the most part. Okay, is, is that an area that um, should be looked at at the same time, or does it, are we thinking that they're just not as significant? My, my property is on Flett Creek, and so it, it does feel like a significant creek there, and I was, mm -hmm. I'm curious if, if that's something that the city pays additional attention <coughs> to, or if we... Like the actual size and flow and that sort of thing? Well, not that so much, but the regulation. So this, we have a shoreline master plan that has to be updated every six years, and mm -hmm. my guess is that the underlying code related to everything else that's not covered by the shoreline master plan hasn't been updated since the city became a city, and I'm wondering if it does get updated or if it needs to be updated. Well, the critical areas ordinance was updated in 2015, so I guess that would be the first place to look to, to see what type of critical area protection would be along Flett Creek for whatever reason, steep slopes again, or, or whatever it would be. Um, I don't know other than that where the city is with um, environmental protection on water bodies that aren't covered by this program. So again, let me, let me do some follow-up for you. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Commissioner Wagaman. And this goes over to the restoration plan. Okay. When, when you start talking about restoring something back to what point in time, because the environment changes even the way a forest grows and those kind of things. So when we talk about restoring, how do we decide what we restore it back to? Yeah. In the Shoreline Master Program, it's explicit that the restoration is to, they call it the baseline condition. So crude example, um, if you were to go along Gravelly Lake Drive and either redevelop a property or start with a, an empty lot and build, what they're saying is if there was a, one of these creeks or lakes on that area, you would need to keep it what it was like before you started that redevelopment or that development. So it's not like the critical areas ordinance, which is the before uh, white settlement, or for lack of a better ways to phrase it. It's going to the baseline of what was it like before you started whatever project you're doing. But the other part to the shoreline <clears throat> master program and the restoration plan is that's the regulatory requirements. You have to at least keep it status quo. But there's also this idea of no net loss of uh, shoreline and shoreline uh, condition. And this restoration idea of over time, you're not only preserving what you had, but you're working toward uh, improving the condition of shorelines through these voluntary activities uh, or some other group is doing something that the city might be coordinating with. So it's not restore back to before anybody was here. It's look at it as of right now, and once you're done, it has to look like it did today before you started your project. But then what about the invasive species of plants like scotch broom mm -hmm. and some of those kinds of things? Uh, that may be there when I start to build, but if I can just keep it the same, we, we probably don't want that. So how do we Correct. get that fixed? And it may be another regulation that would cover that instance, where if, if it's an invasive species, it's going to be another rule, another regulation on the books that would say that would need to be removed. Um, and or it's something actually in one of these governed water bodies where they say if that's found, yes, you do need to remove that. It would just be a matter of looking at what rules are going to apply based on what property you're on. So, I mean, certainly when you look at Lakewood, they are... Our lakes and our streams are kind of the jewels of our community, right? To make it a livable community. Um, but James brought up the interesting point, you know, some, some of the things that may be not covered by this may be covered by some other rule, but you know, how do we get that into our plan? If we, mm -hmm. if we put our plan together and you know, let, let's say we decide we want to eliminate Scotch broom in our community, you know, just for instance, mm -hmm. um, you know, how, how do we make that plan work and how do we communicate that to, to, to our citizens and, you know, make a change? Maybe, you know, I guess if we think that's invasive, which I do, um, then it would be nice to see it gone. Mm -hmm. And how would we do that? Yeah. And that's, that's really what the restoration plan is for, is to say these are our policies for how we're going to improve the overall condition of the city over time. These are the things that we see as critical short-term. These might be mid- or long-term um, issues to be dealt with. Here's our, here are some ongoing efforts that are done either by the city or by another group. So in this case with Lakewood, 
they've had the fortune up to this point of working with Chambers Culver Creek Watershed to have their work be reflected in this plan, and in turn, the city is helping to fund some of the things that the Watershed Council coordinates. So this restoration plan includes a, an update to what's been done since, for instance, 2013, and it also says these are the things that we hope to do in the relatively near future. And so what you heard in your public comment tonight was let's keep this going and let's maybe step it up a notch or two by in increasing the coordination between the city and the, and the organization. Yeah, well, pre-meeting, one of the comments that was made this interesting to me is, you know, we have our students that have to do projects uh, prior to graduation. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if we've got things put in place here at, at the city level where we're thinking it may, helps work in engaging those groups, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. And, uh, you know, it, yep. it's encouraging to hear that there are people in the community that want to do those kind of things. We just have to make sure, put a plan together that works. Right. Right. right, and so you'll see that before your next meeting. Okay. You'll see that plan. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, um, so when someone's allowed to develop um, within the, the 200 foot shoreline area and if they meet the no net loss, uh, is there any monitoring done to make sure that they achieve the you know, no net loss for, from the pre versus post development? Is after, like after the fact that they, their building's been finaled out and. What you're going to see from the city is the original um, review of what they're proposing to do and all the mitigation that's included within that application. There's going to be the inspections throughout the process of construction. Whether you have any follow-up after the fact from the city at this point, no, not unless another permit would be pulled for something else. Um, but again, this restoration idea, that is a separate process from development approval. And so you may have um, whether it's Chambers Clover Creek or Audubon or the city itself someday, should it have the funding to do so, reaching out to property owners and saying, hey, you are within this area. Are you watching for X, Y, and Z? There's just not the resources for us to be doing that all the time on all of these projects that are being approved. Any other questions? Um, Council Member Brancero. I would just comment to the commission that uh, you know you've heard some comments tonight about, and your your own comments reflect uh, a concern about how do how do we know that we're being effective in in terms of what you know what are we trying to accomplish, and how do we know that we're making a difference to do that? And I would tell you that this isn't the only area of, of city business that that is a concern uh, to be able to go and do that. And the, the city has been, uh, is in the midst of it, has been embarking upon a, a, a dashboard program of looking at what are the, some of the key indicators that then can be transparently both tracked and then published uh, that, that sort of look at doing that. And I would say that the Shoreline Master Program um, and its restoration plan that uh, uh, you know, if the commissioners had some recommendations of some key indicators that they would want to be integrated into the city's dashboard program uh, that would serve to do that, uh, that would be a valuable recommendation if you were to have some of that nature. Thank you. Go ahead. So if there's no other questions or comments about Shoreline, we're good to go. We'll switch over to Title 18A, which I know is your favorite topic as well as mine. <laughs> Um, actually, where we're at tonight is the um, consideration at each of your meetings is going to get shifted a little bit because there are other topics that are a little more time sensitive. Uh, for instance, the 2019 Comprehensive Plan Amendment Package uh, and a couple of other things. So after tonight, we're going to take a brief respite from 18A, and it'll be back in front of you again in May. Um, but what I wanted to provide for you tonight is just a summary of 
really the backbone of how this thing is put together. So if you recall from two weeks ago, we talked about the overall arching, starts with state law, comes down to regional policy, county level, and then to the city. And then we talked about where the Planning Commission steps in and, and reviews uh, Title 18A as well as a couple of other sections of the code related to land use. And then we talked about um, how the reorganization of the tables from pages and pages of text on we are in this zone, these are the types of things you can do. Tonight I wanted to walk through, um, and we don't have to do this in excruciating detail, but just stop me and tell me if you want more, um, those three highlighted chapters there on the right-hand side, the basic provisions of the new 18A, the administration section, and then the uh, chapter called discretionary approvals. So within those three, you get a pretty good idea of how the rest of the chapter is going to work. And you also get uh, a pretty good idea of if someone were to apply for something and then want to move through the appeal process, you know, what are the different steps to do that? And just like Chapter 18A30 suggests, what discretion uh, does the city have to, excuse me, provide a couple of different types of approvals for a project? So if you'll remember again from last time, on the left-hand side is your old numbering system, the old chapters. The right-hand side are the new chapters. And hopefully there's a more logical flow in and of that, just the way the 18A is being put together. So 18A10, uh, the purpose there, I've provided the whole language, but just as a reminder for everybody, what 18A is all about. Um, the broad intent of this code is to implement the Lakewood's comprehensive plan as now adopted or maybe amended in order to protect the health, safety, and general welfare of Lakewood citizens. And the regulations herein work toward overall public goals of providing for orderly development, lessening street congestion, providing fire safety and public order, and ensuring the adequacy of public infrastructure. So that is the point of 18A. And then you'll see the chapter subsections that follow that. So you have the scope, how to, how to read the chapters, um, how to compute time. So how many days equals 10 days? Is that including your weekends? Is that including holidays? That kind of stuff. Uh, measurements and interpretations. Measurements is literally one foot equals 12 inches, those types of things. Um, if you have a situation where you're calculating density, for instance, and you have half of a, of a lot, how do you add that into your density calculations? Does that mean you get more lots or less lots on the size of your parcel? Um, talking about how it has to be consistent with the comprehensive plan. There is a new section, 18A10090, that mentions comprehensive plan amendments and how that process specifically is handled. Um, and then I believe we talked about last time the establishment of the different zoning districts and the overlay districts that the city has. And then there's the downtown sub area. There may be other sub areas in the future. Uh, and then talking about boundaries and uh, the end section of 18A10 is the definitions. And I didn't have that for you last time. I should have. But Really, that is kind of home base for anybody reading the new 18A, because within that chapter, all of the terms that might be uh, questionable or confusing or could be interpreted multiple ways, they will be defined there. So if you go to another part of 18A, you read a name of something, and it's like, what the heck is that? What, what does that mean? You can go to the definition section, get that clarified for yourself, and then know that that's, that's what it applies to within this chapter or within this title. 18A20, the administration, so just as you might think, that's talking administrative process. The fees and the types of applications that would be submitted to the city. What constitutes a complete um, application? How do you review when there's multiple applications regarding a, a single parcel or a single project? What is complete? Uh, how do you approve or appeal a process, or a project, excuse me? Um, how long does the city have to respond to requests for information? And how long does applicants have to reply back to requests for additional information from the city? Uh, how long an approval is good for? So for instance, someone uh, submits for a plat uh, in year one and by year five they haven't done anything with that approved uh, application. How long does the city have to keep that open and active and wonder whether something's going to happen to it? Um, there's mention toward the end there of annexed land, so uh, I know in the past the city has talked about annexing part of JBLM actually to be part of the city. If that were to happen, this is explaining the process by which rules for the city would then plop on top of what's happened already out there, 
and move forward uh, as that land becomes part of the city. And then there is a transfer of development rights chapter within the code. 18A20 sub 2 is nonconforming uses and structures. So I know you all have heard nonconforming uses discussed in a number of different ways over time. This is a, an attempt to pull pretty much everything about nonconforming uses into one chapter because right now it's spread throughout 18A. So this is explaining what is a nonconformity or a nonconforming use or lot. How do you um, track them? Do they stay nonconforming but allowed? For instance, if, if a property is sold or if a business is sold. Uh, what types of work can be done on a non-conforming building without having to get a new uh, permit and or without having to bring that up to code or make <clears throat> changes to the structure in order to bring it into conforming status. Uh, and then talking about the conditional uses that are allowed within a non-conforming uh, structure or lot and then review of administrative decisions there at the end. Part three, there's not a whole lot of uh, change here substantively, but again, this is pulling a number of areas of the current 18A into particular sections of the new code. Public notice, how is that to be done? How many people get notified on a particular project, for instance? <clears throat> the fact that the city relies in, in many instances on Pierce County Assessor Officer uh, Office data. The joint public hearing uh, process that might be used on occasion. So we were just talking about the Shoreline Master Program. There's actually within code the ability for the Department of Ecology and the City of Lakewood to do a joint hearing. So both, both entities have to do a public hearing on the process. We can do it together. Here's how. And then part four talks about appeals, whether it's an appeal from a city council decision to court, whether it's appeal from a hearing examiner decision to the council or to court, uh, and where there are no appeals sometimes for some city council decisions. So again, just bringing it all into one spot and making it very clear and readable. Discretionary approvals, this is a section in 18A30 related specifically to comprehensive plans. And again, this is a section that goes along with the one I mentioned in 18A10, specifically about comprehensive plan amendments. Right now, Lakewood's code is very vague and muddy as to how to apply to uh, make a change to the comprehensive plan, either the map, the zoning map, the land designation map, or text, and so this is bringing it all into one spot and making it very clear how that happens. Conditional use permits. The, the proposed 18A takes away some of the administrative uh, decisions that are made by the city right now. Um, the city is a little over 20 years old now. When it was first incorporated, much of the city code was actually picked up from Pierce County and dropped into a municipal code. But the council knew that part of the reason that the incorporation happened is people didn't necessarily like the way development had happened within this area. And so they said, okay, development staff, we're going to give you a lot of discretion. So as time goes by and you're coming up with un or unanticipated situations come to you, we're going to let you have discretion on how to make a decision. Fast forward 22 years, things are pretty set. People know the, the desires of the council, the desires of the public. And so that discretion for, for staff is not needed anymore, at least nearly not as much as before. And um, it's time to make it a little more predictable for people who are looking to uh, either move into the city for the first time or redevelop uh, or expand or what have you. So there are conditional uses, but this is a process for um, uh, a little more public hearing on, and public consideration than would be for an administrative or a staff level decision. And that's a, that's a purposeful proposal here coming to you. Cottage housing, this is not really changed from the current code, but it is brought into new numbering systems starting at 18A3220. Um, there are uh, anticipated within the city cottage housing or smaller homes on smaller lots uh, purposely to design, uh, uh, provide uh, maybe more affordable housing, uh, a different housing type than the traditional house that you might see in much of Lakewood's uh, geography. Development agreements are a contract, essentially, between the city council and a developer where they may not follow verbatim what the code says, as this is, if you have this much acreage and you're in this zone, you can do X. A developer agreement allows the developer to come to the council and the council to haggle, if you will, and come up with a specific, um, unique project that may be not anticipated in the uh, city code 
or it may have different types of density or different types of buildings than were anticipated. But because it's a contract, they are held to uh, what that says. The city council is aware and agrees to what's allowed. Uh, and this is just the process by which one of those would be uh, um, de developed and proposed and then considered. Then we get into general land use review and approval. So this is your how to apply to do something within the city uh, on land and en ensuring compliance with adopted plans, policies, and ordinances in the city of Lakewood. Planned development, so PDDs. You guys, I know, have had PDD applications in front of you or you've talked about them before. And if you recall, last fall, there was a PDD application that came to you and then there was a question of whether it was quasi-judicial or not. Um, in some cases, PDDs are quasi-judicial and sometimes they're not. But in any event, this is talking about how planned development districts um, are handled through public hearings and the findings that a hearing examiner would have to find in order to approve it or to condition it. Talks about what certificates and approvals are needed and, it, and will there be an expiration. So again, if they take a long time, how long does the city leave it open as an active permit? Or when do you say, okay, this is obviously not happening, we're gonna close the application. The rezone and text amendment, this is uh, the quasi-judicial code amendments you considered in January. That's now gone forward to the council and they had a public hearing on it actually yesterday. So the council will be making a decision probably on March 4th that will go into that section of the code. And so whatever they decide, that will be the rezone and text amendment chapter. Temporary use permit, I don't think there's any changes there from the current code other than renumbering. Transitory accommodations, uh, tents, sheds, huts, cabins, trailers, not permanently attached to the ground, intended for temporary occupancy, usually for recreational or humanitarian purposes. So again, there's not a lot of change here from the current code other than renumbering. Variances, this is, uh, a definition is right there under part X or part 10. Modification of regulations when authorized by the hearing examiner after finding the literal application of the rules would cause undue and unnecessary hardship. So a hearing examiner makes the decision where a variance is gonna be authorized. And if it is, then here's the conditions of approval that, that the hearing examiner would need to, to find in order for the project to go forward. Unusual uses, this is really unanticipated uses. So this um, package goes forward and gets adopted by the city council this summer. Brand new technology drops. There's a whole new way to build houses that isn't included in your, your current code by next year. And so someone comes forward with that application. This is how the, the department director or the hearing examiner may decide whether to let that go forward before the council uh, were to adopt any amendments to the code. So again, this is just changing times, changing technology, uh, new technique for building of some kind. This is where that would be anticipated. So those are your three big chapters of how the code is supposed to work and the general categories. And then the rest of the chapters kind of complement this, if you will. So are there any questions? Any questions? Commissioner Wagman. Go back. Excuse me just one second. Um, would it be possible to get a spreadsheet or something like a spreadsheet that basically takes what your slides are here, you know, where you have the, the section and then what it is, and maybe that um, top paragraph, what the purpose is. It, what I'm finding out is I'm reading through this thing, you know, how do I keep my notes? Mm -hmm. and, and then I can say, hey, I can put a check that I've read that section. <laughs> uh, and yeah. then when I read this, should I be reading it like I'm coming to the city to get something done, so, so like I'm a contractor or a homeowner that wants something, mm -hmm. that, that's probably the way I should read it, correct? Yes, and I will just apologize to the entire commission with how this is going to be coming to you. This is completely rewritten, meaning it's not a red line strikeout document because it's been so reorganized. Some of it has been rewritten substantively, some of it's just moved around, but because there were so many changes, there was just no way to get you a readable document that had all the changes, red line strikeout. So you're looking at a new document even though some of the language is exactly the same. But yes, we can try to provide you with watch for this, watch for that, this is where there's amendments. And then in terms of how to read it, the intent is 
anybody, anyone, whether they're a regular user or a one-time user, should be able to understand and walk through the different chapters. And if they've got a particular question, figure out from the table of contents where they might be able to go to get an answer. So yeah. You know, so, so your slides you just did here looked to me like a nice list and that there was a block over the side where you could put sure. notes. And if I had more notes than that, I could just say, see attached page and then I could okay. put it in behind so when I come back. Yeah. I'm trying to be like Mr. Guerrero, you know, with lots, big lists of stuff. Okay. But just to give you an idea, yeah. when you read through, you see certain things. On page 171 of our, our, of our packet, it, it, this was just an interesting statement to me. It says, in its um, subsection C, it says, diminish the reliance of current development patterns on automobile use and over time integrate multimodal transportation opportunities into new development and redevelopment to support pedestrian, bicycles, and transit, as well as cars. Mm -hmm. So we're going to take cars out, then we put them back in. What page are you on? <laughs> that, it, that's page 171 out of 303. And it's, it's at, see, it was just, it was just a, a funny statement. So you probably want, we probably want to look at some of those. Sure. Try to understand why they wrote it that way. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't make sense, at least it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I, I think what they're trying to do is say, hey, we don't want cars in our community. And then we turn around at the very end and say, well, as cars, you know, we want to add them in. So that. Yeah, I see what you're saying. It's yes. And there may be language again that isn't being changed in this draft. It's just been moved. So it's 25 years old now and it's time to rewrite it or it's time to update it. Yeah. OK, we can provide that to the council or for the commission for sure. Any additional questions? Comments? All right. Okay. If not, you have those three chapters in tonight's okay. packet. Um, if you want to spend some time looking at that, and then we'll come back to 18A in May, as I mentioned. But we're going to be moving on to other topics that are more time sensitive over the next few meetings for the for the commission. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Byron. A report from Council Liaison, Mr. Council Member Brenstetter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the um, a couple of uh, actions taken by the City Council that the uh, Commission might like is that uh, um, yesterday evening the Council took action to approve a final plat for a new subdivision. Um, this is a subdivision of 15 residences. It's on um, <clears throat> the 6200 block of 88th Street. And the best way I could describe that to you is that it's nested in behind Burr's Restaurant on oh. Stelicum um, Boulevard there. Um, so it is a, um, the actual area is is zoned multifamily one, but in multifamily one, single family residences um, of uh, aren't allowed use. Um, and uh, this particular development is going to be a mix of a row of townhomes and some standalone single family residences along with a, uh, a lot set aside as a community park uh, and being able to go and do that. Uh, this is, uh, this is a um, approval of a final plat where the preliminary plat was approved in 2016. That's the amount of time that it takes in the, and for the developer to meet all of the requirements, which includes putting in a lot of infrastructure and, uh, and other things before that could be, could be done uh, to do that. Um, that um, the uh, council has also taken action to uh, add to the zoning changes that will be in the 2019 cycle. Um, and we passed a resolution 
uh, starting the process to initiate consideration of rezoning three parcels of land that sit behind Western State Hospital uh, to the north that have been uh, open space and recreation too, and that in uh, uh, part of one of these parcels included part of the uh, Fort Stillicum golf course, uh, as well as some others, but the parcels essentially are parcels that are a bit of a buffer between the Oak Brook uh, uh, R3 residential area and the public institutional uh, area that's there. Um, it's anticipated that this is going to fall under the category of being a, a site-specific zoning that will use a quasi-judicial hearing examiner process should the council approve that process uh, <clears throat> in March. And so while it would be of interest to the commission, it won't be an action item that would is anticipated coming to the commission because it is zoning within a, a specific overlay district for, for open space and recreation um, that, that we're looking to do that. Uh, that actually the council considered five parcels as to whether to do this uh, that fit into there because we were looking at the factors of the closer, closure of the golf course and also some communications that we've had uh, with the Western State Hospital about how they would like to redevelop some of the land that they own uh, to build two new hospitals. Um, and uh, the council is, is concerned about how that would be done and, and that would fit into a, a master plan for the campus of Western State Hospital. Um, but we thought we wanted to move at this time to at least carve out these three parcels that, that form that buffer uh, so that the eventual drafting of a master plan for the hospital <clears throat> would know that and would have that in in, in place, and we'd be uh, we'd be sure that regardless of what occurs with uh, perhaps new facilities being constructed and old facilities being decommissioned, uh, that. Uh, we, we maintain a significant amount of, of open space and particularly open space as a buffer between neighborhoods uh, and whatever activities are going on on the hospital grounds. Um, that uh, the, uh, the actual plans of DSHS and the Western State Hospital for how they really want to grow or change um, is, are, are still a significant amount of time and have some of the processes that we were just talking about in 18A to go, go through to, to do that. But we're, um, you know, we're hoping to set some parameters on the playing field with that, this, this particular zoning change. Um, that essentially, I think that's the uh, the major things that the council has done that would be of of, of interest uh, uh, of, of interest to the to, to the commission. Um, and but I'd be glad to answer any questions uh, or uh, alleviate any or confirm any rumors that any of the commissioners may have heard. <laughs> any comments, questions? Uh, I'm curious, are those those properties the ones owned by the state? The, the three properties you're talking about? The, the three parcels um, that um, <coughs> two of them for certain are owned by the state of Washington, okay? They, are, they, they have been parcels though that have been for essentially nearly 20 years zoned for open space and recreation. Uh, Two, and we're changing them to one because one is a 
um, the allowed uses in open space and recreation one are a lot more passive than what might be done in open space and recreation two, where you might construct a venue that had uh, uh, spectators or that would generate more more traffic or, or, or a number of things. Uh, they were two because um, open space and recreation two happened to include golf courses. Okay. And there was a golf course there at the time that the initial city zoning code was was put in, and so that they did that. But uh, <clears throat> we're looking for it to be a very passive buffer open space area that's ac that, that has as, as access and, and more appropriate to change it to open space and recreation one in the view of the council. Uh, again, we anticipate that this is a, a matter that a uh, hearing examiner will consider under a quasi-judicial uh, process, and then if any, nobody likes what the hearing examiner does, then it would get appealed to the city council. Um, so <laughs> uh, that, that's the direction in which we're going. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. oh, Commissioner um, Wagaman. Yeah. My question is, you, you made the comment that they started in 2016 did the planning per and the permitting process, and it took, you know, we're, we're 19 now, so three years. Um, hopefully we got to where we wanted to be. My question is, as we're looking at some of these rules and regulation, are there ways that, because for developers to be interested in doing some of these projects, time is money. And, and, mm -hmm. and I'm not saying that we y yield to the developer totally, but sometimes, we may be able to help collapse some of this time and we get a better benefit and they get some benefit. I, I guess that I would tell you that in this process of the creation of a subdivision and of platting it, that um, the action that occurred in 2016 is that the developer proposed all of this and made the case for what he wanted to build, uh, to be able to do uh, to the city uh, in 2015. And in 2016, after some public hearings and that, the, the, the matter got before a hearing examiner <coughs> that approved the preliminary plat which essentially is a go-ahead to the developer to begin to do things, uh, start to put in the infrastructure, the utilities. Uh, in this particular case, uh, there were, uh, it, it, it laid out a blueprint that says, this is what you've got to do. It, it, it talked about fencing that was needed. It talked about some setbacks. It talked about, mm, uh, approval to to remove oak trees, but how to mitigate that and 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 and, and, and the mitigation was you've got to plant or arrange to have planted five trees for every one you take down. That uh, it, it 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 got approval of, to go in and start to put in the sewers and roads and 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 and, and do all of that. So that in 2016, the developer essentially had to go ahead to, to get permits and to do work and, 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 and has been doing work, that there is a point of a, of a final plat. It means the, there's a final document that'll be recorded with the county that establishes all the lots and, 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 and all the rules that go, go, go with that. Um, and, and that actually occurs before you actually build the first house. But you get, you know, if you can envision a subdivision going in, you see roads and water lines and things. We've we got the point where all that is done. <laughs> now it's a question of you can either sell the lots or build on the lots to, to, to be able to, to, to go and do that. And to be honest, uh, A time frame of a bit less than three years, given where the months were, okay, um, 
is actually pretty quick. Uh, you know, we look at the developments that uh, are out there uh, that had uh, up to five years before the preliminary plat to the final plat, particularly when they're subdivisions as opposed to short plats of, of uh, 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 being able to go and do that. But it's um, the, uh, the timeline that's important to a developer on the time is money piece is when they propose their project and when they get the preliminary plat approval with the, the list of conditions that they've got, got to meet to be able to prepare the, the subdivision to, for, for actual construction. And um, so uh, my, my reference to 2016 to 2019 was, was merely a, a frame of reference that actions like this take a while, okay? Um, that uh, in the infrastructure takes time to put in so that you can get uh, uh, something to do that. But it is, uh, as, as far as I know and what I heard, that there weren't any gaps and delays because there was, the developer was having some trouble trying to get approval or some permits for things other than the perennial trying to get all the approvals for all the sewers. <laughs> uh, that, um, and uh, th th this is more of, a, of an average timeline. It certainly wasn't a, a significantly slow one, and it's faster than some. Yeah, I guess the, the last question I'll ask on that is, if we ask the developer what his thoughts were, would would he agree with your assessment or or not? And and you know I don't know how that affects us. I don't know how many more of those kinds of projects we're doing in our community. But since we're going through this set of rules here, it might be worth you know asking some of those questions. Is, is well, I, I I guess that my frame of reference to answer you that way is. Um, <clears throat> reading the record of the hearing examiner's hearings and, and efforts, uh, both the public hearing and, uh, and, and in his, his final decisions. And there were, as there are with these, uh, um, these situations, there are always neighbors. And there, in this, in like this one, there were neighbors that came forward with concerns and the the city uh, allowed and gave voice to those concerns uh, the uh, that but that none of them of the concerns of neighbors were all able to be accommodated without any contention or anything that caused going on no one who be who testified at the public hearing and became a party of record that had standing to appeal appealed. <laughs> um, so I think that the the the, the developer I, I think would would share that this was a a process that moved <coughs> not at breakneck speed, but that moved. Uh, you know, uh, at, 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 at an ordinary uh, way with uh, uh, people working with each other to be able to go and do that. And that's not the case with, uh, with all things. We do get developments that um, either, the, either the city or neighbors or things uh, that there are there are issues about we want you to do this and I don't want to do that, but that wasn't the case with this particular um, uh, plat. Thank you so that, much. Would that be uh, your, 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 your recollection from having more daily interaction? Yes. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Any additional questions or comments? 
Okay, um, any reports from the commission members? Um, staff? Uh, just to give you a heads up that there were several written comments submitted to you tonight during public comment. You will get those tomorrow um, electronically from Ms. Devereaux along with the table for taking notes for 18A. Uh, we'll put that together and send that out to you. And then future agenda topics, as I mentioned, we're gonna set 18A aside for um, the next month or so. So next meeting, uh, remember early start for the picture. So if you could be here at six o'clock instead of 6.30 on the 6th of March. And then uh, that day will be the public hearing on the Shoreline Master Program and we'll have the restoration plan here as well for you to review. Uh, then the action on Shoreline Master Program, if you're ready to do so, would be March 20th. And then that'll be the night where you'll begin consideration of uh, the staff information back to you on those applications for 2019 comprehensive plan amendments. And there are, um, I wanna say 13 or 14 in total. There's four private applications for MAP changes, and then there's some text and map changes coming from the city. So those will be reviewed with you on March 20th. April 3rd will be the hearing for the 2019 Comprehensive Plan Amendments. Uh, there'll be a, an opportunity on the 17th of April, should you need it, to discuss and kind of figure out if you want to make any recommended amendments yourself to that package. And then on May 1st, you're scheduled at this point to take action on the comp plan docket, and then 18A will come back to you. Thank you. Um, any last minute comments? Okay. I'm supposed to clean up like uh, Chris <laughs> did for the next meeting. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's the standard for us. Uh-huh. The high so, bar. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And thank you, you so much. color coordinated. Yep. Okay, meeting's adjourned. Thank you.